from our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capital Journal. Leading the news this week, a messy dust up between state agencies has gotten messier. Last week, we reported that Department of Veterans Affairs Commissioner Kent Davis filed an ethics complaint against Department of Mental Health Commissioner Kim Boswell. Governor Kay Ivey called the complaint frivolous and it was quickly dismissed by the Ethics Commission. This week, Ivey asked Davis to resign as Veterans Affairs Commissioner. In a letter to Davis, Ivey said that his agency acted irresponsibly in its handling of American Rescue Plan Act funds. She said, quote, your agency mishandled an ARPA grant program by, among other things, proposing on a substantially delayed basis uses of grant funds that would be ineligible under U.S. Treasury rules and regulations and or state law or policy. This put into jeopardy the state of Alabama's ability to fulfill its obligations under ARPA and your agency's ability to most effectively serve veterans." End quote. She gave Davis until the end of the day Thursday to resign, saying she was prepared to take further action. On Friday morning, Davis announced that he would not be resigning. In a statement, he said, quote, I respectfully disagree with the inaccurate claims made against the Alabama Department of Veterans Affairs this week. It is my desire and, I and will continue advocating for Alabama veterans. We have come a long way in supporting our nation's heroes, but the mission is far from complete. It's important to note here that the VA commissioner is not a member of the cabinet and does not report directly to the governor. He reports to the State Veterans Affairs Board, but the governor chairs that board and appoints many of its members. So, in response to Davis's refusal to resign, Ivy has called a special meeting of the State Veterans Affairs Board in which she can call for a vote on terminating Davis as commissioner. She released several pages of letters documenting the dispute over ARPA and opioid funds between the Department of Veterans Affairs, the governor's office, and the finance department. She said Davis's working relationship with other agency heads has become irreparable. That board meeting will be Tuesday, September 10th at 2.30. Legislative leaders this week backed the governor's decision. Both House Speaker Nathaniel Ledbetter and Senate President Pro Tem Greg Reed released statements supporting Ivy and calling for new leadership at Veterans Affairs. We caught up with State Senator Greg Albritton for a reaction. As the Senate General Fund Chairman, He's been closely involved in the, in the disbursement of ARPA funds. I don't think the funds were mismanaged. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think there were issues about the intent and, and some of the obligations, as I understand it. Okay. Uh, but I think the finance and uh, uh, department caught some of these, made inquiries, and pursued from there. The finance department had not caught it and had not taken the appropriate steps money would have gone out the door and then it would have been a significant problem okay so so I think the system worked in this regard now how that affects uh, the director uh, and others I, I don't know earlier in the week before this back and forth with the governor Davis helped lead an event at the state capitol aiming to raise awareness about veteran suicide and resources available to help those dealing with the invisible wounds of war. Yeah, today was intended to kick off something called Operation We Remember, which is a visual reminder to the citizens of Alabama about the critical um, issue we have with veteran suicides in the state. The starkest reminder of the difficulty of military service is your flag draped coffin, which sadly appear every day in our cities and small towns. Each coffin represents a life, a, law, a dream shattered, and families that will never be the same. So if you know a veteran, just take a moment to tell them that 988 Press 1 is available if they ever find themselves in need. Alabama prides itself on valuing life. This is one of those examples. What better way to take care of life than those who have dedicated their lives to service to this country. We cannot forget about them. Wars do not end when the shooting stops. Sometimes those wars linger in the minds of veterans for years afterwards. It's important we remember that. It's important we take care of those lives. 
after the shooting stops because those invisible wounds of war sometimes linger for a long time. Despite the issues at the Department of Veterans Affairs, state lawmakers on the Legislative ARPA Oversight Committee this week offered overall praise for how most state agencies have managed those funds. Capitol Journal's Jeff Sanders was at that meeting and has this report. Since the allocation of American Rescue Plan funds, or ARPA, in 2021, efforts to upgrade Alabama's water and sewer infrastructure have totaled over $1.2 billion. Good cooperation with the local folks. They see the their needs are, are going to be able to be addressed, and uh, we, we fully uh, depend on them to, to be good partners in this. Lance LaFleur, director of the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, informed lawmakers that communities across the state are contributing over $660 million in matching funds alongside ARPA and other federal dollars. This brings the total investment to approximately $1.7 billion. However, LaFleur noted that this amount still falls short of meeting the state's infrastructure needs. We have projects that have been requested from water and sewer systems around the state totaling about $3.4 billion. So we'll be able to satisfy about one half of the uh, funding requests. Although the needs continue to surpass available resources, lawmakers on the committee offered praise for Lafleur and his team. I remember back, I think, our first ARPA uh, meeting upstairs on the sixth floor, and there was an issue, and, and we kind of challenged you and your organization at that time, hey, let's, let's help these cities be successful, and you've done absolutely that. And the result has been, we don't have any stain on anything on this. We've handled it correctly. We are getting new infrastructure in the state that would not have been. While Adams' use of ARPA funding received praise, lawmakers expressed continued frustration with the Alabama Department of Economic and Community Affairs over its continued push for fiber optic broadband expansion in some rural areas. They noted that more affordable alternatives like the satellite-based Starlink are available, even though ARPA funding does not cover such services. If you're an Alabamian, you've got school-aged children uh, that may graduate before the, the government internet gets to you, there's a $300 solution and it works just fine. And according to federal law, all ARPA funding must be spent by the end of 2026. Reporting from the State House in Montgomery, I'm Jeff Sanders for Capital Journal. The board that manages Alabama's health care program for teachers is going to ask lawmakers for an additional $134 million in fiscal year 2026 to meet increased costs. The board for the Public Education Employees Health Insurance Plan, or PHIP, met this week to discuss how to meet increased costs resulting from federal policies. Medicare recently cut its payouts, meaning more of that burden goes to the beneficiaries. And the Inflation Reduction Act passed by Congress reduced the federal government's cost share of prescription drugs that RSA provides for teachers. The board is also exploring other ways to meet those increased costs. In the last legislative session, lawmakers considered but eventually killed legislation that would have increased the online sales tax to make it even with the state's average local retail sales tax. The idea was to level the playing field for local businesses. State Representative Chris England has pre-filed an updated version of that bill for the 2025 session, and he hopes he can win support from his colleagues. It's a bill that increases the simplified solar use tax to make it equal to the state average. Um, state average can be anywhere from nine and a half to 10, depending on where you live. And this would raise the simplified solar use tax from eight to 9.25, and then take the excess and spend it on education on, on a per pupil basis to local, local city and county school boards. And simply put, the reason why is because the SSUT actually redirects money away from the education trust fund, especially on the local level. And this is an effort to try to help some of those county and city school boards recoup some of the money that they've lost over the last few years because of the SSUT. Well, it's actually years behind the curve in the sense that 
when we first passed the SEC2, we did it because the Supreme Court said online sales couldn't be taxed in the same way. So we passed this as an incentive for places like Amazon to collect a, sell, collect a tax on transactions that occur online. But the law changed. So we can, in essence, oppose a fee or tax on online transactions. So honestly, we're cutting off our nose by, to spite our face because we're giving a bunch of people money that did not have anything to do with an initial transaction, but it is costing local education in the same places hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of dollars. Congressman Barry Moore was in the capital city this week sharing an update with the Chamber of Commerce. As Congress prepares to reconvene with the end of the fiscal year approaching, Moore said he is hopeful that lawmakers can tackle inflation and the national debt. Inflation is a concern. Our spending is a concern. We're running $100,000 a second the interest on the national debt. At least before we left in August, it was 100,000 a second. It's probably 105,000 a second. That trillion will probably pass in 105 days this time instead of 110. So, folks, we don't have a revenue problem in Washington D.C. We got a spending problem, and you know that's this CR is that they just keep passing rather than passing the 12 approach bill, which is what Congress is supposed to do in the House. We're supposed to pass 12 approach bills to fund the government. We haven't done that, I think, in 30 years. I'm not exactly sure how many years, but we've got a few of them across the finish line this year, and we're working in that direction. I think this country's brightest days are still ahead of it, but we've, it's, we've got to change course a little. We can't spend them, keep spending so much money that we can't afford it. And we can't keep a border wide open where people aren't safe. And we've got to be tough on crime. We've got to protect our communities. I think it's dangerous if we don't. And that fentanyl that's poured in here is coming across that border. We've lost 100,000 young people to it. And warn your kids, I, I may have mentioned this last time, but I mean, the Xanax, they, they think they're buying a Xanax. They look at it online and it's laced with fentanyl and it kills them instantly. It's a poisoning. And that stuff's pouring in here. It's pouring in here. Got to secure that border, get spending under control and de-weaponize this government. It's that time of year when, as Jimmy Buffett said, we try and reason with hurricane season. Weather experts are pointing to between four and six tropical systems that could, that could pose a threat in the weeks to come. Capital Journal's Randy Scott reports. For the Atlantic Basin, especially for the Gulf Coast, our peak time of year where we typically see the landfalling hurricanes is typically in August and September. The beautiful weather will make people forget it's the end of summer, but they shall also realize when the peak of hurricane season. This week, weather broadcasters point out a busy Atlantic Ocean and Gulf of Mexico with several areas that could potentially give birth to new storms or hurricanes. We do have that outlook. We have an 85% chance of an above normal season, which just basically means that all of those necessary ingredients are all there for tropical cyclones to develop and for tropical cyclones uh, to maintain themselves and their relative strength. It doesn't necessarily indicate how many landfalls we have. Jessica Chase is with the National Weather Service in Mobile. Just because you're not on the coast doesn't mean you don't need to prepare, but again, making sure that you follow those trusted sources, know what that terminology means and, and know what to do. You know, if there's flooded areas, not going into flooded roadways or flooded areas and, and taking those watches, warnings and that local guidance seriously and implementing those plans should you need it. Even on a day like this, you will tend to forget that it's officially hurricane season. But officials with the National Weather Service want people to know that it is. And now's the time to get ready just in case a storm comes to town. It's just important to maintain that awareness, uh, have those trusted sources, and, and not necessarily let your guard down just because it might not be in the, the peak season or, or what we are you know, typically used to. Uh, we all know, we all live here, we, we know what we expect, but sometimes weather uh, kind of goes against what our expectations are. Keeping people safe this 2024 hurricane season. It's going to be a, a long season. It's going to be a, a potentially busy season. And so making sure that you get that information from trusted sources that are there to help and protect and, and educate uh, versus other sources that might have a lot of information that might not be the necessary information. In Mobile, Randy Scott, 
Capitol Journal. When we come back, Attorney General Steve Marshall will join me to talk about the crime issue and various court cases. After that, Legislative Fiscal Officer Kirk Fulford offers an update on the state's budgets as we approach the end of the fiscal year. And later in the show, Troy University Chancellor Dr. Jack Hawkins joins me to talk about his recent decision to retire next year. Plus, we preview his upcoming documentary, Beyond a War. You won't want to miss that. Stay with us. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is Alabama Attorney General Steve Marshall. General, thanks for coming on the show. Always good to be here. Thank you. It's been a while and it's good, good to have you back on. Lots of topics to talk about, but I want to start with crime. Uh, it's, it's kind of a scary topic and um, we've seen some crime here in the capital city. We've seen it in other uh, cities across the state and across the country. You are, you are part of this task force that was recently created to really crack down on violent crime here in the capital city. Can you talk about that? What, what, what went into the formation of this task force and what are y'all doing? Yeah, first of all, remarkably proud of the work of the men and women that are a part of this group. I mean, they are not generally assigned to this, this duty, but they've had already tremendous success. I mean, 280 plus outstanding warrants served, including people that were out on capital murder charges, murder charges, attempted murder charges. We've seen uh, fentanyl taken off the street, countless illegal guns that have been seized, as well as other arrests. And so uh, really proud of the work it's done. And I'm hearing tangible results uh, from people that talk about in certain parts of Montgomery that they now feel safe going out uh, on their front porch or we had cookies delivered to our office as a result of the work that's been done. But mm -hmm. huge, uh, Kudos to, to Hal Taylor and the, and the group at Aaliyah because this was their desire after we've heard from so many about what can we do to be able to assist in Montgomery to come up with this concept of not only the partnering with our office, with the Sheriff's Department and then members of the gang task force at the Montgomery PD, but what we could do to make a difference in the capital city because, you know, look, what goes on in Montgomery is bigger than Montgomery. Sure. I mean, this is the capital of Alabama. What we know is being reported here is applying to Alabama in the minds of many outside of our state. And maybe similar to what you know, took place in Mississippi around Jackson for a while is some of the narrative that's taking place in Montgomery. But I can tell you that there are some remarkable law enforcement officers dedicated to that mission that are doing good things. But uh, Hal Taylor and, and Sheriff Cunningham here in Montgomery deserve remarkable credit for the work they're doing and really proud of the folks from the AG's office that are likewise a part. Mm -hmm. So I you know, saw Montgomery Mayor Stephen Reed the other day said, look, crime is actually down. He says it's down 12, 13 percent. I, I guess that's violent shootings or whatever. So are we, is it more vibes? Are we just, you know, is that, are you seeing different information or anything or, or is he off? Well, I, I can't speak to the data that the mayor is talking about. I can tell you that crime data is not always real time. But the one thing that, that I think gets lost a little bit in the equation is sometimes we look at, say, for example, homicide rates. And I don't think that's necessarily a great statistic because one thing when you look at the researchers, they'll tell you is that because medicine's better, we're saving more people. Yeah. And so part of that needs to be how many individuals have been shot, how many have lost their lives, but also what shootings are taking place. I mean, we remember the story of the uh, party that was in Montgomery with what, I hear 1,000 people and 200 and something shell casings there. Yeah. You know, by the grace of God, we didn't lose anybody. Does that mean there wasn't a significant event there that we should be concerned about? Absolutely it was. It may not show up in the data. And I so think, yeah. I think sometimes uh, perception is reality. And there are people in Montgomery that, that said, I don't feel safe. Yeah, yeah. And that was where the state responded. And again, very pleased with what we've been able to do here because what feedback I get, and, and it's more important what I hear through uh, people stopping me at the grocery store, because I live here, this is my home. And people that send us constituent mail 
it has been very positive about the work that's been done because here's the reality. Montgomery Police Department is down significant numbers, yeah, they, which yeah. means that they don't have the ability to do the things that historically that we've done. We see the same thing going on in Birmingham, you know, where numbers are at historic low levels compared to where they've been just numbers in the last officers. decade. Yes. Yeah. And, and when, you know, the tide recedes, it allows for the bad guys to do bad things. And so I think what this effort has done is really be able to put law enforcement in places where we haven't been or with numbers that we haven't had before. And one of the more gratifying things for me is when I have a Montgomery police officer come up to me and say, I had backup last night mm -hmm. and I hadn't had backup in a while. That means that we're doing the right thing, not only for the community, but also to be able to support local law enforcement here in Montgomery, because that's really what this is about. Yeah, it probably gives them a lot more confidence to go into those areas you know, that, that they have to, those dangerous areas. Well, look, we, we've got a legislative session coming up in February, be here before you know it. And I keep hearing that this issue, crime, is gonna be a, a big one in terms of, you know, let's, let's get to the root of these things. Let's try to pass some policies that might help the situation. The one thing that I keep hearing comes back to this Glock switch ban that kind of turns a handgun into a spray, you know, machine gun type thing. Have you been approached by anybody about legislation? Is your office considering any legislation related to crime as it approaches this next session? Yeah, definitely having conversations with individuals who have not been approached about the Glock switch issue. But you know, one thing that, that we're trying to remind local law enforcement about is the bill that we were able to get passed uh, in the most recent session dealing with gang activity in communities. Mm -hmm. That bill includes an enhancement of penalties for somebody that's connected to a gang, committing that gang offense, and they do it with a handgun that has a Glock switch. We're able to elevate the punishment there. And so one thing that, that we've gone around the state and done is to be able to help train local law enforcement. Candidly, I think we gotta do more at the local level to be able to use that tool that's available to us. Um, but we've already seen the legislature be able to embrace an opportunity for us to try to send a message of deterrence to those that wanna be able to use these devices. But yet, we remain open to be able to talk about what other things can be done. Sadly, for too many years while I've been AG, seemingly we've been on the defensive, where I think that we've pushed back from things that have made good, solid public safety decisions in the last several years. And so I think we'll be glad to be aggressive. The other thing is we need to be able to talk about what it means to be a law enforcement professional and why we need to be able to recruit, recruit young people into the profession. For so long, we've had a negative narrative around law enforcement. At least some bad apples have tainted the entire profession as a whole. And I can tell you they're my heroes because every day I see what they do, one of the things that has nothing to do with legislation is what is it that we can do to enhance the ability for places like Montgomery, for Birmingham and other cities and counties around the state that are short officers, how do we bring people back into that profession? And I hope that'll be part of the discussion that we have. Yeah, that's really interesting because when you, you know, talk down the profession, it's, it's gonna result in, you know, down the road and, and reduced numbers. Let's switch gears and talk about some litigation. Um, the transgender ban has been once again allowed to proceed uh, as it awaits that trial. When is that trial gonna happen? Will it happen and when might we see that evidence? Yeah, right now the, the case has stayed um, because Judge Burke has decided based on the fact that the United States Supreme Court is taking a case out of Tennessee that adopted a similar law to Alabama, uh, wants to see what legal standard emerges from the court. And I'm very proud of the fact that Alabama has led that effort across the country in talking about what is the appropriate legal review of a state trying to protect its kids from being part of a failed European experiment. And really do want to give kudos to our Secretary of State who during his tenure, Wes Allen, led that charge for Alabama. And I think we were one of the first three states to pass that ban. And the one thing that this litigation has done for us, and maybe the Department of Justice now greatly regrets intervening because it opened the doors of discovery for us to them, is that we've now been able to see the interplay between government officials, Rachel Levine being one of those, Admiral Levine, with uh, medical the community as well as these advocacy groups that are influencing the development of standards of care to meet their philosophy and not what's best for kids. And I think what you've seen as a result of the summary judgment motion that we filed has been picked up nationally in the conspiracy that we've revealed among those parties to the detriment of kids. I mean, when you've got 
one of the highest ranking medical professionals in this country, and Admiral Levine calling a medical group to say, remove age restrictions on surgeries on kids because you're hurting our efforts to help transgender people, that's wrong. And we've exposed that, and I think Judge Burke is not going to take uh, a very favorable look at, number one, how this was proposed to him to begin with. Because the early stages, you heard the federal government say, oh, this is the standard of care universally accepted around the world. Well, what we've revealed is that's not at ex all the case. We've seen, and you and I have talked about the CAST report that came out, comprehensive review over four years uh, out of Britain which has absolutely exposed the lie that's been going on for years. I'm proud of where Alabama has led that effort nationally and will continue to be involved with it uh, at the Supreme Court. Relatedly, uh, Title IX, this was an, a directive from the White House, from I guess the Department of Education, changing the rules about uh, a, a very important part of law that was designed to increase women's participation in sports at the you know, high school level. You've been involved in that. Where are we in, in, in Title IX discussion? Yeah, and by the way, one of the most bipartisan and successful pieces of legislation we've ever seen, going back to the early 70s, saying, let's give women equal educational opportunities as well as access to sports. We've seen the results of that, and this administration wants to destroy it all. We've seen multiple states, red states, come together through litigation across the country. In all of those cases now, we've been able to s obtain a stay of the rule that was gonna be effective August 1 that would have impacted Alabama's law that says male bathrooms are for males and female bathrooms are for females. That We say that boys are not gonna compete against girls in sports would have jeopardized our ability to be able to enforce that law. I'm very pleased about the success not only we obtained for Alabama, but also what we've seen around the country. And the other interesting thing about that litigation is it's for the first time we've seen conservative nonprofits group also engage and get relief for their members as well. Moms for Liberty is a group that many have heard about. And not only did Moms for Liberty obtain relief for what have been chapters in Alabama, but also in blue states that chose not to be able to challenge the rule. And so I think it's a very interesting uh, sort of piece of litigation, but right now, consistent with the wins that we've been able to get around gender affirming care, we're getting that same uh, victory as it involves the, the changes they're trying to do to Title IX. Hmm. Well, we'll follow both of those cases as they work through the courts. Um, I wasn't able to ask you last time, because uh, it was still pretty early in the investigation, but your office was the subject of a attempted bombing, I mean, kind of a makeshift bomb. Um, like I said, last time you couldn't really talk about it, but there is a suspect, I guess it's, it's, it's in custody. I'm not sure where the, the process is. But can you talk about that situation now that it's a little more time has passed and, and this person and uh, maybe what, would in, what we now know about them and, and why they did what they did? Yeah, first, great deal of gratitude to federal, state, and local partners who were able to solve this case because it was not easy. Uh, you had the individual that now has pled guilty federally, uh, still doesn't mean that state charges wouldn't be forthcoming, um, decided that he wanted to to push back against the governmental institution, which is the Attorney General's office. We have him on camera, walking around the city of Montgomery with Antifa signs, social media talking about okay. uh, his outrage against conservatives, against individuals that profess their faith, very anti-government with his rhetoric. It's so it a, seems political, not random. I don't think it's random at all. He knew exactly where he came to as far as the city of Montgomery. He was in and around all of the Capitol buildings themselves. I think more will come to light about maybe what his intentions are that I don't need to speak about at the moment. But yet, for the people that work in my building, and I have a remarkable group of individuals that are dedicated to helping the people of Alabama, and this was a direct attack against them. And to the extent that we're able to solve it, understand that we do not believe that there are other actors involved, that he in fact was kind of the lone wolf idea, uh, I think has given uh, our folks a sense of, of relief, knowing that they don't have to be concerned about coming to work. But no doubt, he tried to send an absolutely contrary message. And to the extent he wanted to attack somebody that was conservative, that professes their faith very publicly, then you know I'm probably the guy that, that he comes after and the institution that I represent he comes after. Um, but the fact that law enforcement came together, I think, in a very uh, fast and remarkable way allowed us to solve a case that was not the easiest to solve. Mm. 
political violence puts things in perspective. Obviously, we just saw an attempted assassination of you know, the former and possibly future president. It just really shakes you up. So yeah, uh, thoughts are with your staff and, and everybody. Well, look, while I've got you, I have to ask you the, the question on everybody's mind. 2026 is coming. Um, you are often talked about as a possible candidate for governor. Might we see you on the ballot running for the top job in 2026? Well, I've got to have a job in 2026. Let's Can't make run that for clear. AG again, right? Can't run for AG. And, and look, and amazingly blessed to well, have almost 10 years under my belt at the time that that's over. But I've got to figure out what I'm going to do. I want to feel where I'm led and where I'm called. And maybe in a weird way where I'm most burdened to feel like I need to find my space. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be politics. Mm -hmm. You know, I will be 60 this year, so life is not over. Um, but I know that's a decision that, that, that my wife and I will have to make here soon. And, and, and I'll make sure that you're one of the first to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're going to have a lot to say uh, about 2026. It's going to be a huge election year because we've got, obviously, Governor, all the constitutional officers, most of which are going to be open seats. Um, you got the entire legislature and also the U.S. Senate. We don't know, you know, whether or not Senator Tuberville is going to run again. He hasn't announced. So a big, big year. You know, and the thing that whether I run or not, the thing that I'm most excited about during that cycle is to hear the vision for the state of Alabama. What is it that someone believes that they can do to lead Alabama in those next steps? And I think that's what elections are about when you no longer have an incumbent. There's nobody that's presumed uh, to be the front runner, if you will. And so it becomes that opportunity to have a debate about ideas, about policy and what matters to the people of our state. And I think that's where leadership is going to be shown and that's going to give the people of Alabama an opportunity to make a choice. Absolutely. I'll be the first to say it matters who is in that governor's office. It really does matter for the state. General, we're out of time, but thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. We'll be right back. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is Kirk Fulford, Legislative Fiscal Officer for the Legislative Services Agency. Kirk, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. If you're on Capital Journal, we're talking budgets. Yes. And uh, we're here at the approaching the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we had a story earlier this week talking about um, the latest budget numbers, um, kind of um, an update, kind of a monthly update on, on what happens. Part of the headline and the lead said that we've seen the first sales tax revenue decline in like 15 years or something, but that doesn't really tell the whole story. Can you kind of walk through the, the sales tax revenue situation? Yeah, so uh, the Education Trust Fund consists primarily of income taxes and sales taxes. Two biggest sources, 93% of the total revenue in the Education Trust Fund is income and sales tax. What's happened is uh, the growth in income tax has offset the decline in sales tax. So even though sales tax will wind, gross sales tax will wind up negative for the year, the growth in income tax will offset that. So last year the bottom line growth in the education budget was basically flat. This year it's going to be somewhat flat again. About 1%, a little over 1% growth is what it's looking like right now. Uh, but the budget was not relying on growth. So we're still in a positive position. We don't need any growth in the last month of the fiscal year to support the, uh, op the obligations that are already out there for the budget. So it's a great place to be. Mm -hmm. And the members knew that when they made the policy decision that they did to reduce the sales tax on groceries. And I think the issue with regard to looking at a snapshot of bottom line gross versus this year versus last year is kind of ignoring the fact that this year is different from last year, right? Last year had a base of 4% that included uh, groceries, and this year it's 3 So it's really not comparing apples to apples. We had anticipated a decline in, in sales tax revenue because of that, but we also anticipated an increase in the other revenue sources to offset that. So uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're close to where we thought we were going to be, and it's really not surprising to, to be in the situation we are now. The last time, you're right, the last time sales tax has declined, was uh, 2009, and that's also important to point out because that was at the height of the Great Recession. So, so that wasn't policy; that was a recession. That was this a is different. that was a horrible recession, and the la the time prior to that, when sales tax declined, was 2001, 
which was also during the recession. So okay. income and sales taxes tend to trend right along with what's going on in the economy. Uh, as you indicated, this time it was a little bit different and it was a policy change as opposed to a, a bad econ economic situation that caused the decline. Um, and our economy is doing fine. Our revenues are still growing. Um, and we were able to absorb the decline and still have a positive outcome for the year. So I think it's a great place to be. That's good to hear. Well, let's talk about that policy. You know, cutting the sales tax on groceries. They did it on an incremental approach, That just that one cent mm -hmm. uh, this past year. Obviously, has had a, a fiscal impact. But I know that they wrote into the law um, there have to be certain economic benchmarks met in order for that second cent to come off. Right. Where are we in that? Is that going to be even feasible with where the numbers are? Right. So the, the way the law is worded, it requires the average of the estimated revenues between our office and the, the Department of Finance to be above 3.5% for the succeeding budget year in order for the second rate to come off. Um, we did that first calculation back in February for fiscal year 25 that begins in October and the average of the two estimates was not three and a half percent. So there will be no reduction in fiscal year 25. Now we will do the same thing again in February for fiscal year 26 and it's a little early right now to see uh, or to guess exactly what that number is going to look like at the moment. There's a lot to play out in Washington uh, that's going to have something to do with how we see the, the the outlook for 26 um, coming into play. So mm -hmm. uh, too early to know right now, but at some point in time, those numbers will kick in and that rate will come off. Now it's a uh, 1%, 1%, and that's where it stopped. We'd have to go back to do any more than that and change the law. Okay. Well, it's always interesting because, I mean, pretty much everybody in the building uh, wanted to reduce the sales tax on mm -hmm. groceries, Republican, Democrat, but it comes with a consequence. It comes with a revenue consequence. And when you see that that hit, you know, to the to the education trust fund, it, it makes it real. So I understand why they put those benchmarks in there. Kind of a significant benchmark, you know. It's, I mean, that's um, not not going to hit that every year. Not going to hit that every year. Although average growth in the education trust fund going back for 25 years is right at three and a half percent. So mm -hmm. I think that's where the three and a half percent number came from. If we're at least on average where we have been over a period of time, then we'll change, the, we'll lower the rate again. If we're at some point in time lower than that, we won't. So uh, that was the policy decision that was made in order to hit the trigger. And it seems to be something that's feasible in terms of making sense about why you would have a trigger point. Uh, it just, as you indicated, it won't be that every year. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the general fund because yeah. that uh, continues to be a really healthy fund, largely based on the growth in interest rates, right? Because their interest rates are still really high. Yeah, uh, this keeps me up at night, but uh, general fund dollar-wise is actually growing this year at a higher amount than the ETF. That's you, never, you, <laughs> that you, seems like upside down world. Yeah, for the, for the same reasons I indicated, ETF is primarily income and sales taxes, so when the economy's good, those things are going great. Uh, this one's a little different in that, as you indicated, the growth in the general fund has primarily been driven over the past couple of years by interest on state deposits, which is, is twofold, right? It's based on the amount of money we've got on deposit plus the uh, interest rate that's in play. Uh, rates have increased substantially since 22. The last increase in interest rates was July of 23. Uh, but according to uh, Chairman Powell's uh, comments uh, earlier this month, all indications are that there'll be a rate cut in se at their September meeting. Now, from that point forward, I think it's anybody's guess what the Fed's going to do. And I think a lot of that's also going to come into play with regard to the presidential election and, and what happens after that. Um, they had indicated earlier that they would do three uh, 25 basis points cuts, uh, which is pretty substantial. Uh, in 2020, uh, there was there were two cuts at the same time. There were 150 basis points, and from that point to the end of the year, our interest on state deposits, and we had far less money deposited at that point in time, uh, it declined by almost 47 percent. So it's really alarming to me your, the timing of it and how much money we've got on deposit, and at the same time we're trying to spend down the federal money because we have to get a lot of that out the door mm -hmm. uh, in a short period of time. It's really troubling. Um, so that. Those, those good times in the general fund aren't going to last forever. They're not going to last, for, not with the exponential growth. Now, average growth in the general fund is about a little less than 5%. Uh, so 
Uh, right now, we're clipping along at 7.6. Last year, we're a little bit above uh, double digits. So we have had and experienced uh, exponential growth. The, the key thing to point out is, like this year, uh, we're up by $223 million through September. It's about 7.6%. 146 million of that growth is interest on state deposits. Mm. Uh, so there's about 40 different revenue sources to the general fund. The other revenue sources have grown by only $78 million. So you can see uh, the impact that, th that a re decline in that revenue source would have on the growth in the general fund going forward. And just for context, in 23, it grew by $364 million. The, the revenue source uh, came in in 22 at $40 million. In 23, it was 404, and it'll be 550 this year. So in a period of two years, that revenue source has increased by over $500 million. Wow. Well, a lot of numbers that you're throwing around, but uh, there's good news. Y'all have now this online dashboard where anybody can go online and check out the revenue yeah. numbers and the budget numbers. I think we can throw it up on the screen here. There it is. Yeah. So tell us about this dashboard and how it came about. Okay, so uh, as, as you're aware, the first of the session, we do a presentation to the legislature about the conditions of both of our budgets, uh, how much money we think we have available to spend, um, and the economic conditions of the state. Uh, but at that, once we do that presentation, we really don't have another touch point with the members until they come back to town the succeeding session. So they pass a budget, and we really don't give them any updates periodically about what's going on. So uh, I had the idea to create a dashboard, and uh, I won't say it was an original idea. I have looked at uh, other states. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a member of a national organization that, for people that do what I do. And I saw some things that I liked and I thought it was important for us to maintain contact with the members so that they can actually see uh, as much as they want to what's going on with the budget, what revenue sources are changing, uh, how much growth do we need to get to, or to cover our obligations. And we've also included this month a snapshot of uh, what the 2025 budget looks like in terms of what all, what was appropriated, uh, general fund, education, trust fund, federal money, and otherwise, and it just gives an idea about where all the money goes or where all the money's been appropriated so far. Yeah, that's super helpful, and uh, don't be surprised if you see some of these graphics end up on Capital Journal from time to time. Well, I appreciate it. That's uh, We've had a lot of positive feedback on that, and uh, I will not claim credit for doing any of the work. It was just my idea and my uh, my staff, and. Uh, others in my office are, are really, really smart, and they pulled that together, and it looks great. So it I, I certainly won't claim credit for it. It does. Well, thanks. We, we appreciate the information. Well, Kirk, we're out of time, but thanks again for coming on the show, yes, and we'll sir. look forward to session. All right. Thank you. We'll be right back. Since 1997, Alabama Public Television has provided programs, services, and resources to child care professionals, teachers, and parents. Visit aptv.org slash education to learn more. James Withers Sloss started the Sloss Furnace Company in 1880 to take advantage of the mineral wealth of the Jones Valley. He built Sloss's first blast furnace the following year. A second furnace soon followed and Sloss Furnaces produced 24,000 tons of iron in its first year of operation. Sloss Furnaces was an industry leader in innovation and design. Its superintendent of construction, James Pickering Devell, led Sloss through a period of modernization in the 1920s that resulted in Sloss becoming the second largest producer of pig iron in the Birmingham district. A slump in the iron market took shape in the 1950s, business began to decline, and pig iron was basically obsolete by the 1960s. Higher pollution standards finally closed the furnaces in 1970. In 1981, Sloss Furnaces was designated a National Historic Landmark and today hosts events, concerts, and a metal arts program. The site continues to stand as a testament to Birmingham's industrial past. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is Dr. Jack Hawkins, Chancellor of Troy University. Dr. Hawkins, thanks for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure, Todd. Thank you. Well, it's a big week. The, <laughs> the big news announced this week that you are planning your retirement after 35 years at the helm of Troy University. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the end of an era. Uh, has it been uh, releasing that information this week? Oh, my. You know, I didn't, I didn't know anyone would care, but uh, I've, I've been overwhelmed by the response to it. Uh, 
And uh, so far, all's been positive. You know, life is about relationships, and and uh, there have been so many. You know, beginning with the governor and others that have uh, communicated uh, their support, and I've enjoyed so many relationships. So it's been a it's been a blessing. You know, but in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says uh, to everything there's a season, and uh, so I'm uh, proceeding into this next season uh, still with hope and. Uh, I'll be always be a Trojan. Absolutely. Well, yeah, you kind of personify uh, Troy and the, the Troy Nation uh, and and you know, Trojan Nation. Um, Thirty-five years. I understand you're the longest serving president or <laughs> chancellor in the whole country at at this moment. So that's that's really something. Well, it's uh, again you you enter these positions not knowing that thirty-five years later you'll you'll still be there. But we we fell in love with Troy early. And uh, we've gone from project to project to one exciting event after another. I'm, d I'm proud. I'm really, as I look back, I'm proud of all the students we've been privileged to serve. I'm proud of the colleagues that have been engaged in this. I'm, I'm just really proud of what, what collectively we have achieved. And among those, I've been asked several times, what have you achieved, or, that, or at least what are you most proud well, of? Well, yeah, what are you most proud of? I was going to ask you that. <laughs> well, you know, so much. I, I'm proud that we were uh, uh, reclassified less than a year ago as a doctoral degree institution. We didn't have our first doctorate until uh, 2007, and now we've stepped into that classification. And, and I can see a uh, research university on the horizon. That'll be the full maturity of the institution. I'm proud that uh, we've uh, elevated from Division Two to Division One. We've been successful at the very highest level of athletics uh, in this country. I'm very, very proud that we've become Alabama's international university, and it has become such a diverse university. We have people from all over the world. They come together in an exciting place for quality, and uh, and so we've we've really we've really uh, grown in that way. Proud of what we've done offshore. I'm proud that uh, the media some years ago labeled us the Alabama's most beautiful campus, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm proud too of the stewardship. Uh, but most importantly, I think I'm proud of the quality of our academic programs. We've never been stronger. Our College of Business is one is one illustration is among only 189 worldwide. Uh, ranked by accreditation standards at that level. And so across the board, uh, I couldn't be more proud of the university, but it has not been uh, Jack Hawkins. It's been a collective effort beginning with our board of trustees. We've had incredible support uh, at the, in the legislature and with the governor, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, uh, the, but Dr. Adams said in 1989, and I'll say it now, uh, for Troy University, the best is yet to be. Mm. We're in a good position. Well, going back to 1989, I, I was leading up to this interview, I was talking with some folks about your legacy, <laughs> uh, and the word vision kept coming up. Going back to 1989, the early part of your chancellorship, uh, or I guess back then it was president, right? Um, that, that you had this vision for what Troy could be, and that maybe not everybody saw it the way you did. So, so I mean, what, what was that like saying, look, I know where this can go and re really has gone there, but maybe it was hard for everybody else to see your vision. <laughs> well, I'll never forget my first week in September of 1989. They told me that I needed to make a speech to the faculty. That was a, an annual event. I asked about what, and they said, share your vision. Well, I believe in an epiphany, but an epiphany that's not... Uh, uh, crystallized in the minds of many can be a nightmare. And so we took a year to uh, really study. You can't frame a problem or solve a problem until you frame it. So we took a year. And at the end of that year, we held our inauguration. And I was able to make some statements about quality, about elimination of duplication, which we addressed. But one statement that I also uh, was, was almost fearful in making, I said, we're currently a regional university, but a decade from now, we'll be an international university. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, uh, we, we had a shared vision, a vision, and I guess Thoreau said it best. He said, it's not what you're looking at, it's what you see that counts. We saw a great university. It was really a wonderful place to begin with. All we've attempted to do is to build on that success, and, and I'm proud of those achievements. Well, I think you should be. So congratulations on a uh, 
your legacy, quite a career. Just the statements from everybody coming in really says all you need to know uh, about your career. And uh, so I congratulate you on your retirement. I know it's not until next year, um, and maybe then you get to finally take some time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about this documentary. Um, this is, we had lunch the other day and you kind of uh, were, were premiering it. It's about your service, but also a, in Vietnam, but also a, a, an adversary uh, and how y'all's lives have been intertwined. <laughs> and it's, it's just really fascinating. We're gonna show a clip here, but it's called Beyond the War. How did this uh, documentary come about? Uh, w Todd, you know, life is about relationships. Uh, when I left uh, Vietnam in 1969, I never wanted to go back. I went back in 02. We set up academic programs in Hanoi, the capital of old North Vietnam. In fact, my first hotel room overlooked the Hanoi Hilton where mm. John McCain and all those POWs spent all those years. We set up programs in Saigon, now known as Ho Chi Minh City. We began to offer those programs. In 2008, we were the first American university to ever award the bachelor's degree in Vietnam, and we did. But it was in 2017 when I was invited, when I was in Vietnam, to have dinner with a gentleman by the name of Le Con Co. And what I was not aware of at the time, Le Con Co was a hero, but he fought for the Viet Cong. Mm. We were at war with the Viet Cong. They were the insurgents. And uh, but he talked about a partnership, and so we, be we began to partner with Dewey Tan University, the institution that he created. And this year it'll be 30 years of the existence for that, that fine university. Over time, I learned to really appreciate Le Con Co. We developed uh, a great relationship. And then about two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, his children, uh, in recognition of what had been achieved, they initiated this documentary. It was produced and uh, it, released, it was released and shown in the Central Highlands of Vietnam in late 2023. In January, it aired nationwide to really a, a wide acclaim, and then they released it for premiere in this country. And literally what it says is uh, you have a war, wars begin and end, but then relationships last forever. Uh, and that's what we're seeing. You know, we have over 1,200 students on the ground in Vietnam, and we have over 2,000 alumni doing extraordinary things since 2008. So over the last 16 years, we've graduated over, well over 2,000. They're making a difference. But this partnership really does show that, uh, you know, you can turn a negative into a positive. I'm very, very proud of the story that's captured. And it's, uh, and it's really about, uh, about what needs to happen in this world. Mm -hmm. You can fight, but then come together. I think what's missing in America today is unity, and that's what real leadership is about. You can't fight forever. Let's uh, look at our, the commonalities and forge our way into the future. And I hope that's the way this documentary uh, comes across. It airs uh, at the Davis Theater on the 29th. Maybe we can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's going to be the big premiere, right? At, that'll uh, be that'll Davis be Davis Theater, uh, September 29th. Well, let's go ahead and play this clip okay. so that uh, our audience can get a taste of Beyond a War. The war is dirty and brutal and difficult. Why must we take this painful road? có lần tưởng như chết rồi, không thể sống được. Bởi vì cả đơn vị còn có mấy người. She said, how does it feel coming back after 40 years? Well, when we came the first time, we were carrying bullets. But when we came back, we've carried books. Life truly is about relationships. Wow, quite a story about uh, reconciliation, right? I, I think that's probably one of the best words to describe uh, the, the the transformation. Yeah, I, I think it, it it is about reconciliation. Well, we are looking forward to the premiere September 29th at Davis Theater. I'm going to be there. We're going to be talking a little bit on stage, um, and the public's invited, right, to come and, and uh, participate in this. Absolutely. I hope uh, that people will come out. It'll be uh, literally at, from 3 to 5. Uh, 
and we'll have uh, speakers such as Jack McManus. The, the documentary has been endorsed by the Vietnam Veterans of America, their board. Dr. Wayne Reynolds on the State Board of Education serves on that board and has been so helpful in terms of, 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 of that statement. Uh, but we'll also have uh, Gary uh, Rose, Michael Rose, uh, who is a Medal of Honor recipient for the, during the Vietnam War. He'll be there to speak and, and others. And so, uh, you know, we're looking forward to it. I really appreciate you, your, your participation. And also, you know, uh, I would accentuate uh, the invitation if, uh, if people can join us that Sunday afternoon, uh, we'd be thrilled for them to do so. Absolutely, looking forward to it. Well, Dr. Hawkins, again, congratulations on a legendary career, and thanks again for uh, sharing it with us. <laughs> well, thank you, it's a real honor, thank you. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week at the same time right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.